Ahoy there, Captain Benzi here, coming at you with another episode of the Frigate Pilots Manifesto, the series that aims to teach you everything you'll need to know about the different frigates in EVE Echoes. In today's video, we're going to be revisiting a firm favourite of mine, the Gurustus Pirate's Worm, and it's been a while since I talked about this one on this channel, mainly because, well, despite it being one of my favourites, I recently ranked it as the worst of the five faction frigates currently in the game. So hang on, how can it be your favourite if it's that bad? Well, just because something isn't as good as the other options on the table doesn't necessarily mean it's unusable or that it isn't fun. That is something I went to great pains to stress in that particular video. Just because I, you know, think that the Dramiel isn't as good as the Daredevil doesn't mean that I don't love flying the Dramiel. I actually personally find the Daredevil pretty boring. Now, the Worm ranked so lowly because I couldn't actually figure out a decent enough fit for it. This is where, once again, Frosty Jack comes to the rescue. Now, Frosty Jack, for those of you who are fairly new to this channel, um, is a close friend of mine in the Catskull Cartel, and an absolute beast when it comes to flying frigates and destroyers. He recently was featured in the Talwar 2 Assault video, so I need to give another humongous thank you and shout out here to Frosty Jack for helping with this video. Basically, he and I have sat down recently and really sort of bashed heads about how we can get the worm into a position where it's actually useful. And as it turns out, we've managed to turn this thing into an absolute beast. Like some of the ideas that he came up with have truly like mutated the worm from something that I thought was on the lower end of the scale in regards to faction frigates to something that now I am thoroughly enjoying flying again and it's absolutely terrifying in its combat potential. For PvE, this thing is an absolute beast, but for PvP as well, I would argue this is one of the few faction frigates that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with things like the Stabber Fleet issue, and indeed later on in this video, I will be showcasing a PvP kill of a Drake. Yes, the battlecruiser Drake, fit against frigates using rapids and we still manage to take it well frosty still manages to take it out and i just think that's amazing and that's why i wanted to showcase this fit and uh, like showcase that the worm is not as useless as people are making out but anyway i'm rambling on entirely too long for an intro here you know the drill by now hit like subscribe to the channel ding the notification bell and tick all notifications so that you never miss a video check us out on patreon where you can learn all about my life in africa and start earning merchandise and come and check out the red bubble merchandise store if you've ever fancied representing the Catskull Academy um, or the cartel on something like a t-shirt or stickers or notebooks, that kind of thing. Anyway, folks, all of this said and done, let's jump right in then to today's video talking about the Gurustus Pirates Worm. The Gurustus Pirates are one of the five pirate factions currently available in EVE Echoes, alongside the Blood Raider Covenant, the Angel Cartel, the Serpentis Corporation, and Sanchez Nation. And you'll find these guys on the right hand side here of the select faction screen of the ship fitting tree, so we're going to tap on Gurustus Pirates and jump in here. Now, these guys are mainly based out of Venal, which is towards the galactic north of the New Eden Cluster. That is their sovereign region, and as you radiate out from there into Kaldari space, that's where you're going to find Gurustus Pirates Anomalies. And as you go into Nullsec, coming out of Lowsec into Nullsec, you'll find that eventually you might come across things like Gurustus Pirates Dead Space Anomalies, or you scan down some of the Gurustus Pirates Nihilus Dead Space Anomalies. Now, inside those, you'll find the Worm, the Healer, and the Rattlesnake, which are the pirate faction ships for the Gurustus Pirates. Um, you can blow those up, claim their faction debris, the Gurustus debris, and then reverse engineer that into the blueprints for the Worm, which is the faction frigate, the Healer, which is the faction cruiser, and the Rattlesnake, which is the faction battleship. Now, to give these guys a little bit of background, basically, the Gurustus Pirates were founded um, by Fatal and the Rabbit, two ex-Kaldari uh, ex Navy veterans who basically said, enough of this crap, and they flew off and founded their own little empire in space, where they have basically been pirating their Weasley Black Little Hearts out ever since. And they are notorious for stealing blueprints from the Kaldari Navy, um, which is why the, uh, the Worm looks like a Merlin, why the Healer looks like a Moa, and why the the rattlesnake looks like a scorpion. Now, ultimately, um, what they've been doing is building this own little empire where it's traditional piracy for piracy's sake. If you want to just do whatever you want to do, the Gurstus Pirates are there for you, and they specialize in missiles and drones. Now, let's have a look at the actual worm's stats itself, because this is a really cool ship on paper. 
I do actually really like the way that the Gurstus Pirates ships look as well, that sort of mottled, semi-camouflage effect to it. It's not like the uh, the, the, the Minmatar fleet issues, um, the Republic fleet issue ships, where it's sort of an actual green camouflage which perplexes the Everlinging Daylights out of me. This is kind of a sandy one that does actually make sense in regards to space dust, but either way, it just looks cool. Let's have a look at the attributes and fittings though. So the worm itself, you can see it is a drone frigate. It has two drone tubes on it, which can launch small drones only. We then have two high slots, three mid slots, three low slots, three combat rigs, and three engineering rigs. It's a typical faction frigate setup, but of course we've swapped the three high slots for two high slots and two drone tubes. We then have an absolutely massive power grid here of 64 megawatts, and this is insane. This is what one of the worm's biggest strengths. You, this allows you to really oversize some of the modules that you'd be fitting onto here, and exactly that's what we're going to be doing in this video. Defensively speaking as well, the worm is pretty tanky. The shield starts off at 1,562. It's a Kaldari basic ship, of course, um, with a very low armor and very low structure, but nice big shields, and it does get bonuses to its shields as well, which make it astonishingly tanky for a frigate of its size. And again, that's another part of the worm's biggest strength. This is a bruiser of a frigate. It's there and it's able to take a lot more beating than a ship of this size normally can, and it can dish out a lot of damage in a very short uh, period of time as well. One of the more common fits that you'll see with the worm actually crams in rapid, uh, medium rapid launches um, for its missile high slots, and it uses that to go very, cl uh, very close up to an opponent and just hit them in the face with as much damage as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, and hopefully win a DPS race, which is all very well and good, but it doesn't work against some of those bigger, nastier ships, which the fit that we're going to be showcasing later on today does. As we go further down, we've got a good capacitor here, 858 gigajoules is again surprisingly large, it's a Kaldari ship though, it's kind of to be expected, or a Kaldari basis for the ship rather, so it's to be expected, it's going to have a good capacitor because it is going to be using shield tanking, which obviously is fairly capacitor intensive. We have a very solid scan resolution of 722 meters, um, a decent lock target of 5, and a small signature radius of 29.4. That's actually the largest of the five faction frigates currently in the game, um, but it is still a frigate. It is still on the smaller side of things overall. And with a flight velocity of 354 meters per second as well, it is one of the slower of the five faction frigates. That's worth bearing in mind. It's tanky, it's heavy, it's slow. It's your typical kind of bruiser. Now, annoyingly as well, whilst it has a really nice mass of 0.981 million kilograms, it does have a very heavy inertia of 2.85 times, which means it sometimes takes a little bit longer than you might like for it to accelerate, decelerate, that kind of thing. And of course, if you want to be going for a close range fitting, like for example, you're going to use something like torpedoes, then yeah, putting some polycarbon engine housings on there to bring that inertia modifier right down does really help. But again, for today's purposes, that's not going to matter all that much. Now, the final thing I want to talk about in stats, again, I have to come out and actually talk about down here, is its source radius, 148 meters. Again, this is pretty large for a, uh, for a faction frigate. Some of the others, like the Dromiel, go down to right about 113. This is on the larger side of things. But, as we talked about in the Talwar 2 Assault video recently, that 148 is actually still really useful. You're probably going to be scanned. Like, people can scan you and can jump in on you if you're in low sec or null sec. But, because you are just about small enough, you should be notified when doing so, and then it for, therefore it's then up to you whether you stick around and see what comes in to challenge you, or whether you just warp to safety there and then, making the worm an excellent ship for doing uh, high-level low-sec anomalies. If you want to go into like the, uh, the the tier 10 low-sec anomalies, like 25 million -esque. Um if you're like me, wanting to farm some of those the uh, the storyline mission scrolls, um, the worm is an excellent choice for that because it's capable of clearing those tech 10 expert level encounters quite comfortably uh, and fairly speedily too thanks to a good amount of DPS. It can also do so pretty safely due to the fact that you're going to be hard to scan and if anyone does scan you, you're almost guaranteed to be notified that they are doing so. Anyway, let's jump back in and have a look at the trait description. 
Now, being a Gurustus pirate's ship, Gurustus, by the way, is Kaldari for naughty, which I find hilarious. Um, clearly, the Rabbit and Fatal had a bit of a sense of humour when naming their pirate faction. They are literally the naughty pirates. Anyway, the roll bonus of a Gurustus pirate's ship is a 200% increase to small drone damage and a 200% increase to small drone EHP. Now remember that's on top of the usual 100% the drones themselves have, meaning that the two drones that you have act as if they are six drones. Each of those drones qualifies as if it was three. It's got the DPS of three drones and it's got the health of three drones. Now, of course, that is a double-edged sword. It means you've got two drones, you only have to worry about having two drones to manage and send out into space, but if someone does destroy one of them, that is half of your drone DPS gone instantly until you can launch another drone and send it out. But of course, you're using small drones, so against bigger targets, if they do happen to knock out one of your drones, they're going to have to manually lock on to the new replacement drone, which takes a long time because it's a very small target. That's one of the other key strengths here of the worm. Looking at its skill bonuses though, Advanced Small Drone Operation gives us another 10% small drone damage, 50% of full, uh, full training there, and an additional uh, kilometer of drone command range, giving us an additional 5 kilometers again at full training of Advanced Small Drone Operation. Now, if you're using the worm, obviously you should have the drone skill trained right the way up as well. This does give it a nice little bit of extra range, which really helps out with the build that we're going to be showcasing. The additional damage as well pushes you up to 250% damage, um, increase on those uh, each of those drones which is quite frankly monstrous if we then have a look at advanced frigate command each level of that is going to give us a 10 percent increase to missile torpedo kinetic damage and missile torpedo thermal damage it's not a straight up 10 percent increase to the damage it actually works out about a five percent increase to the damage because it's not touching the explosive or the uh, the explosive or the electromagnetic side of things it's only increasing those middle ones but that's still pretty nice to have um, uh, overall there, 5% per level, so 25% at full training. It's still a nice increase to the amount of damage that the missiles do. What's really nice to have is this 4% shield resistance at the bottom there, which obviously at full training is 20% shield resistance. Basically, it's adding an additional 20% onto each of those. So you're going to have about 20% on electromagnetic resistance. You're going to have somewhere in the region of about 35% on thermal, going up to somewhere in the region of about 60% explosive and 52-53% there on kinetic. And that's just basic. That's before you start putting any resistance modules onto the ship itself. So, having talked about like the modules that you can put in, let's actually have a look at fitting this ship. Now, a common fit for the worm, as I've mentioned before, is to utilize its hefty power grid um, to oversize the high slots and use things like medium rapid launches um, in order to just push its DPS up that little bit higher. If you are very intensive, you might even be able to get torpedoes in there for a good whack of damage um, and sort of use yourself as a rushdown frigate where you hope that your additional resistances, your high shields, that kind of thing, um, allow you to stay alive long enough to rush your opponent down to zero. Now, this works amazingly well against enemy frigates and destroyers and certain cruisers, but against anything larger than a destroyer, really, that can come undone very, very quickly. I've also seen people use that additional power grid to fit in things like medium shield extenders into the low slots just to give it that additional amount of tank so it can absolutely massive, uh, massive buff to its shields which keep it alive long enough for using standard torpedoes for example um, to again rush down your opponent and try and beat them quickly. What Frosty suggested, which I was like, I'm not sure how well that will work at first, was to actually utilize a little bit of extra power grid in order to fit medium missiles, not rapids, medium missiles. Now, the advantage of this, as crazy as it sounds, is simply the range. 36 kilometers range you get out of this. On top of the fact that with the training that I've got currently, my drones have a 38 kilometer maximum range as well. So I can sit comfortably up to 36 kilometers away and apply my full DPS here of 448.35. So Frosty, the mad genius, suggested this trialed it and my goodness it is terrifying because being up to 36 kilometers away gives you a lot of extra maneuverability to stay outside of a stab a fleet issue um, outside of its web range obviously those have a 15 kilometer range even something like a talmar to assault is uh, getting an additional range to its uh 
to its web fires, you're still outside of those web ranges. I have seen people take on things like Daredevils um, and some of the other like more like kitey ships out there with powerful webs and just dance outside of the range of them. And they do so in order to avoid that slowdown. And the fact that the worm can keep doing its damage from that distance is frankly terrifying. So this fit actually works beautifully, I find, for PvE and PvP, and I use it in PvP despite the fact that two of the modules obviously don't make sense in PvP, uh, PvE, simply because whilst I'm moving from encounter to counter, I'm going to be scanning and checking who else is in the areas that I might be able to jump in on, and I've personally had some pretty nice kills. Um, some of them I haven't been able to record, um, and recently I had a horrid, horrid day where everyone ran away from me. I spent six hours uh, wandering around um, and I successfully killed a venture trainer and a stabber trainer. The Myrmidons all ran away. I had a raven, got him down to shield. He ran away. Um, a couple of oracles ran away. An Abaddon ran away. Just like, you know, for crying out loud, did someone fight me? Um, unfortunately, I then did actually go after an Armageddon. It warped out of the storyline encounter it was in. I got caught by the rats and blown up which was uh, not fun, but hey, I've rebuilt the worm and I'm still having fun with it now. So the high slots again, we have gone for the Kaldari Navy medium missile launches because of that 36 kilometer range, which is pretty cool. Now, in order to do this, you are going to need to, first of all, pop in three ancillary power grid rigs. Um, this does take up a lot of additional power grid. I've also got both frigate and destroyer engineering maxed out and cruiser engineering is all the way up to expert four, which is giving me a reduction to the power grid requirements of those medium missile launches as well. You are going to need to have both of the cruiser, the destroyer, and the frigate engineering. So this is an intensive skill, uh, intensive in terms of skill points build. Now for the mid slots, we have an explorer, narrow resonance scanner, obviously for locking down your opponents, finding targets to go hunting, and a predator warp disruptor in order to lock them down. Now this of course is only two points of warp jammer strength, which is the weakness of this build in PvP. If your opponent does have anything like some warp stabilizers or a couple of warp core optimizers, then you're not going to be able to lock them into position, which does mean they'll be able to run away. But for anyone who doesn't, they are easy pickings. Two points of warp jammer strength at a range of 30 kilometers. So I have my default orbit on this, set to about 28 kilometers. That means that even slingshotting to try and get me into an elliptic orbit to grab me with a web of fire is going to be very difficult because going from 28 kilometers down to the 15 kilometers, that's a 13 kilometer margin that they're gonna have to slingshot me in order to get that. And hopefully I can catch that in time and actually manually modify um, my orbit to stay out of the range there. Now, you may wonder then, in, under which case, why do I have a, pre a Predator Stasis Web of Fire myself, 14.8 kilometers? If I'm gonna be orbiting at 28, what's the point here? Basically, drones. If I'm going up against something that's got a decent drone control range and can get to that 30 kilometers with its drones, then you can use this to screen them away and keep distance. It also helps with ships, again, like the Daredevil, that might otherwise try and close the gap by coming at you directly. Now, if you can spot a Daredevil trying to rush you down and it's like locked onto you and it's coming in fast because they fit a micro warp drive for some reason, you can then basically turn tail um, and try and just sort of keep an approach, basically. Keep a at a distance by uh, using the approach to keep away from them or heck just pick a direction and fly in it and manually pilot to keep at that 30 kilometer if they try to get close once they hit the 14.8 you hit them with the web and slows them down and hopefully your micro warp drive then is enough to help keep them at arm's reach Ultimately though, this can be swapped for another Predator Warp Disruptor if you're a little bit worried about someone else locking you down. I've also occasionally, in certain situations, if I just feel like it, I, you know, I'm not going to go after Prey like a Daredevil, um, you can swap this for something like a Target Painter as well, which will just help with the application to make sure that your, uh, your missiles are doing as much damage as possible. But again, the majority of your DPS is still going to be coming from your drones. You can see here, 279.95 of this is from the drones. It can still be worthwhile though, adding in that target painter just to help the missiles do a little bit extra. Now here for this fitting, you can see I've got Mark IX warriors fitted into the drone tubes, but I do carry all four types and I carry eight of each. This allows me to swap those on the fly. If I'm going up against a ship that I think is shield tanked, I will have acolytes. 
in the drone tubes and I'll launch those to cut through its shields that little bit faster. If I think it's going to be armor tanked, I'm going to use the warriors, which again have a very nice closing speed as well. Um, otherwise, I sometimes use the hobgoblins and hornets, but for the most part, I tend to just stick with the acolytes and the warriors and use those. But again, I have a full drone tube at all times in case my opponent is going to lock down my drones, destroy them, and try and neuter my DPS. That way, if they destroy a drone, I'm just going to launch another one out there. And by having four sets of eight drones, well, you do the math on that. It's a lot of drones they're gonna to have to get through. All the while, the other drone is still going to be shooting and you're still going to be applying damage with the missile. So you've got a lot of damage capability there. Um, and remember, if they do destroy a drone, when you send out the next one and it goes rushing towards them, they are going to then have to lock onto that again. I have seen, therefore, that one of the other mid-slot options that you could possibly replace the Stasis Webifier with is a Sensor Dampener. If you're going up against things like battle cruisers and battleships, equip a Sensor Dampener in here, because that will mean that if they do destroy a drone, it's going to take them a long time to lock onto the next one, and that can be great fun in and of itself. Now the low slots again, things here do sort of get mixed around a bit. I've gone for a Gist DC type small micro warp drive because we're going for a kiting build. I want to be able to modify my distance quickly and maintain a very high flight speed. Yeah, okay, it's also massively increasing my signature radius by 413%, but at the range that I'm at and the speed that I'm going, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. The third mid, uh, second mid slot is a C-type adaptive invulnerability field. The adaptive invulnerability field, obviously when this is running, 36.49 additional resistance percentage across the board there. Um, with the worm already having pretty tanky resistances, this does really help. Um, and pushes those right the way up to some quite serious numbers. The third slot here, I play with this a little bit from time to time. Here I'm running a C-type small shield booster, which is how Frosty Jack runs it most of the time. Um, you'll see that you are kind of not cap stable here, it's 1 minute 52 with everything here running. Um, so you may find that you do run out in a DPS race, but hopefully you're outside of neutralizer range, um, which will keep you a little bit healthier here. Um, so you can run this and sort of use it to heal up any incidental damage. I use this when I'm intending to be PvEing for the most part, and I'm just going to be sort of swooping into PvP from time to time. If I'm going for a dedicated PvP fit, I actually sometimes either swap this for a damage control unit, um, which is very useful for going down that rushdown approach, just gives you that little bit of extra survivability, like, for example, if you come into a uh, an area with, say, a Naga or something that's got that long range to it and it's a little bit too far away, you can pop that damage control unit whilst you make the approach. Once you're then orbiting nice and close at sort of the 28 to 30 kilometer margin, um, you'll find that their large guns can't hit you anymore, which is one way of doing it there. So if you know what you're going for, you can swap that for something like a damage control unit. Um, in PvE, there are times as well where I've swapped that for a second adaptive invulnerability field just to keep the resistance is nice and high and the passive healing of the ship seems to be more than sufficient to help keep up with that. Now as far as the rigs go, we've already talked about these being 3 ancillary power grid 3 rigs. Fortunately they're not too expensive on the market. On the other side we've gone for a firepower augmenter and two drone speed augmenters. Um, this is your standard DPS setup for drone usage. Um, you're increasing the flat damage and the, the, uh, the speed at which they apply it, thus total overall DPS increase. That gives you a nice comfortable 448.35 DPS with the skills that I have, which I will talk about in just a second, um, nice and briefly. You get a good defense here, 6760 across the board, um, pretty nice EHP. Capacitor, as I said, isn't stable, but I'd say it's not a terrible un instability either. 1 minute 52, I'm comfortable with that. I like to, anything below 1 minute 30, I start getting antsy, but the 2 minute mark I usually find is sufficient with proper um, sort of application, as long as you're watching it and, you know, controlling that shield booster so that you don't just have it running the entire time, you only use it when you need to, you should be okay with that. Targeting is really good. Signature radius here has dropped all the way down to 29 meters. Um, which, uh, sorry, not dropped down, that's what it is. 29 meters signature radius there is pretty nice. Source radius of 148, as I said, makes you difficult to scan without being notified at least. Very useful for PvE. And navigation, decent enough flight speed of 513.3, which again with that micro warp drive active, we're going to push that up to about 2500 maximum speed. Fairly low warp preparation. 
duration time, 2.73. You can get caught in gate camps with this, so do be careful. Um, but hopefully, if you are caught in a gate camp, you might actually be able to take out several of the targets um, as you start to, to work your way out. I mean, heck, if you uh, jump a gate into a gate camp, run towards the edge, pick the Dicta and just hammer it with drones and your missiles. You've got 30 odd kilometer range here for crying out loud. You turn that gate camp into the biggest mistake they've ever made. Anyway, let's have a look at the skills that I'm using to support this. Now, as I said, this is obviously a frigate. I'm maxed out on frigate command, um, which is going to help with that flight velocity. For navigation, again, I'm pretty much maximized on afterburner and micro warp drive. Micro warp drive obviously is the one that matters on this fit. Under shield operation, this I could go a little bit higher. That will help with cap stability by having the shield booster be a little less aggressive on my capacity usage. Same on the advanced shield hardening there. Defense upgrade for me to, in order to get that EHP that you're seeing is all the way up to Expert 4. As we move into engineering, these are the key skills that are going to be necessary to get this fit to work. First of all, frigate engineering and destroyer engineering are both maxed out. Um, the frigate engineering there is the most important one, simply because it's going to be the additional power grid um, capacity, that kind of thing. I keep mentioning destroyer because I'm thinking that it has the, uh, the power grid reduction. It doesn't. It's only too small turret power grid need, which is useful, well worth training into if you are flying frigates, um, because you're going to have less power power grid required for small weapons to be used in the high slots. The most important one here though is cruiser engineering, expert cruiser engineering. You'll see that is reducing the medium missile torpedo power grid need there by 6%. That helps me to fit those medium missiles into those high slots. For the electronic systems, we've got a little bit of electronic warfare, targeting's up there to give us a nice decent targeting side of things, and for weapons, well for me, I've got small missiles all the way up to Expert 4 on operation, and Expert 3 on upgrade, and then the same on medium missiles, Expert 4 on operation, and Expert 4 on mediums there as well. Drone, this is then Expert 4 on Operation, Expert 4 on Upgrade, and if we go right the way to the bottom, it's currently at Expert 3 on Drone. I'm still training that one up just to get that one nice and maximized. That will give you the capability of the fit as we've just showcased here. Now, of course, it's all very well and good me talking about this fit. Let's have a look at it both in PvE and in PvP to prove how terrifying this can be. This footage is again from Frosty Jack, showcasing him attacking a drake that he has just discovered here in Losec, in Galente Losec. Um, he's arrived here, he's got within the 30 kilometer radius of his, um, of his disruptor, he's only running one disruptor, it's the exact fit that I've just showcased here, um, and as he's hit that range he sent in the drones, here he's gone for two acolyte drones, makes sense, they're electromagnetic drones, he's up against the drake, the drake is going to be shield tanked if the pilot knows what he's doing, um, it should be shield tanked, so those are going to help cut through that tank a little bit faster. Now, it's at this point, whilst he's cutting through that shield, I'm just going to say, I did try and get my own footage for this one as well. I genuinely spent six hours flying around trying to find targets, and I was going to do a little montage here where I showed the fact that there was a Naga that kept running away, a Myrmidon ran away from me three times, I had an Oracle running away, I had a Raven which I got all the way down into his armor, he then ran away, and um, the only damage I took in that fight was from the rats as they were shooting at me. And just, I spent hours and everything seemed to run away. In fact, the only kills I got were a Venture Trainer and a Stabber Trainer, which just aren't really impressive enough to put in a video like this. But anyway, here we are. Frosty is about halfway through the shields now. This is a big shield tank, and that Drake obviously has a good-sized capacitor bank that is aggressively healing up the damage that uh, Frosty is doing. Obviously, there is only an Algos and a Catalyst, currently Tech 4 versions, also attacking that Drake, which just aren't going to be doing enough damage to really do all that much. So what Frosty needs to do here is essentially just hold out until eventually that tank breaks and he just needs to keep an eye on things keep firing keep flying and those drones will eventually pull it down you see one of the drones there does get blapped by the drake frosty sort of takes a look and decides what he's going to send out next he's just going to send out another acolyte because it is again still on the shield tank that electromagnetic damage from the acolyte is going to be nice to you know help cut through that shield that shield obviously has a lower resistance to electromagnetic damage than it does to any of the other damage types. The drone closes the distance, begins its DPS, and again, the uh, Drake has taken out the other drone, probably still locking on to the second one now, um, which is kind of an interesting point. So, Frosty, a little bit of time there to spot that that had gone, but it's back out. 
The fact is that when he sends that second drone out, the drone, uh, the Drake, sorry, has a fairly low scan resolution, and the drone is obviously a very small target, so it does take probably in the region of 20 to 30 seconds to actually lock onto that drone before he can start shooting at it, at which point the other drone is still doing damage, the missiles are still applying damage, and the drone that he's just replaced, that the Drake is now trying to lock onto, again is going to be closing and doing that damage, especially since Acolytes actually have a surprising flight velocity. Now it does look like the tank is beginning to break here on the Drake. Frosty kind of got held up at the halfway point for a while. That is now beginning to break. He's down to about a third of the shields left um, and that is going down at a bit of a faster rate, which is fine. Frosty is still sitting at around 66% capacitor, 67% capacitor there. He's not losing capacitor at any alarming rate. He's taken almost no, well he's taken no damage at all to his shields. Now, curiously here, for some reason, Frosty pulls back the drone. I'm not sure if it wasn't applying its damage properly. Um, as he pulls it back, he then sends it back into combat. And yeah, the damage does actually seem to have gone up a little bit. So I don't know if the drone was bugged there for him. Um, but we're coming now towards the end of the shield tank. Um, and again, Frosty still sitting a good, comfortable 65% capacitor, full shields, nothing to worry about there. And it's looking like this guy just at this point, the, the Drake doesn't really know what he's going to do because he's not attacking the drones. I don't know, maybe he's called for help and he's, you know, waiting for some friends to show up, at which point Frosty needs to burn him down quickly um, before they do. I do like how Frosty does this in the footage as well, like zooms in on the ship that he's targeting just to say, hey, look, I, I, I don't even need to keep an eye on my ship and space around me. I'm just going to watch the damage that I'm doing. As I'm getting to the end of your shields, I want to start seeing the damage on your armor. That's <laughs> kind of grim when you think of it that way, uh, but I love it. And it makes for some interesting footage as well, so I'm not complaining too much. <laughs> There we are. Look at all those pock marks as the missiles and drones are doing their thing and ripping through that. Now, it's interesting. I've not seen the Drake try to slingshot him yet. I don't know if the Drake has um, anything like uh, Webifiers um, that are just, you know, obviously out of range of the worm or if he hasn't fit them or what. I don't know what's going on. I know for a fact, as you'll see later in the drop loot, um, he is running Rapids. And in fairness, Rapids don't quite have the range that Frosty needs either. Um, there goes another drone. This time around, I think he's possibly about to put a, a warrior out. I certainly would put a warrior. Yeah, he thinks about it for a second, then he puts a warrior out. Because we're now on the armor tank um, and the warrior dealing explosive damage. Um, yep, there we go. It's going to put two warriors out. The warrior dealing explosive damage is going to work much faster at breaking through the armor. Armor obviously has lower resistances um, to explosive damage, whereas shield has the higher electro uh, the has lower resistances to electromagnetic. So you want electromagnetic or thermal against shields. Against armor, you want explosive or kinetic. Ideally, explosive it tends to be the better one. Um, it does look like the the shield tank still hasn't quite broken. Um, the <laughs> <laughs> it's still healing up from time to time. You get a little burst of shield, um, which Frosty then has to chip through and then take the armor down. Um, there's a part of me that thinks I personally might have left that as an acolyte and a warrior, just in case uh, every time he reps shield, the acolyte is just going to go nope and slap that little bit of shield back down, leaving the warrior to do its thing. I don't know. I don't know which way would actually work better. You'd kind of have to test that a little bit. But we're coming toward the bottom of the armor tank now as well. This Drake pilot must really be feeling it. Um, Frosty does elliptic in a little bit there. He went to, I think, 24 kilometers for a second. He's back at 26. Um, I don't know if the Drake is trying to keep that kind of distance. That might also be why um, Frosty is watching closely here. And just making, you know, keeping an eye on the Drake to see if it makes a sudden angle shift. Because if it makes a sudden angle shift, then it means he's trying to slingshot Frosty into an elliptic. There, that looks like a sudden shift, although it might just be the rotation from uh, where Frosty's orbit has now gone basically to the other side of the ship. So just that kind of 180 degree flip. Now that I think about it, that looks more like the actual thing that's happened. Um, this poor Drake pilot, though. Seriously, this poor Drake pilot. Frosty's still sitting comfortably at 26 kilometers, which appears to be outside of the range of the uh, the Drake's uh, rapid missiles. I can't remember if Drake's get a range boost to any of their missiles or if that's uh, not a thing they get, but certainly it seems to be, you know, uh, Frosty's very much keeping out of the range. He's taking no damage at all. The capacitor has hardly shifted below the 60, you know, it hasn't gone below 60%. It's hovering around the 65% mark there quite comfortably. 
and yeah, he swapped back to another acolyte. Um, the acolyte here makes sense because obviously the uh, the structure tank on any ship is completely equal to all resistances. It's got 33% across all the board to all resistance, so it doesn't matter which drone. But because he obviously, as a, uh, a drake, has shield tanking, shield is the one that he's going to be repairing. The armor's gone, and armor doesn't passively repair. Um, so there's no need for the explosive damage anymore. Explosive isn't better than electromagnetic against the hull, um, and it is better against the shields, which this ship is now going to be sort of struggling to try and fight and maintain. But here it is, we're coming towards the final blow now. Poor Orion Ikeoa. Uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Ikeoa? Ikeoa? Or however you pronounce that. If you're watching, my sincerest apologies for butchering your name. But either way, I think we're about to see it. That Drake is about to go down to a faction frigate. <laughs> There's the explosion. There's the capsule. Um, Frosty tends to do what I do. He tries to lock onto a capsule and take it out. Some people consider this bad manners, and even online it's considered bad manners because it does um, sort of cause someone to lose their uh, any implants they have. And there we are. You can see the loot. There was a damage control unit there and some uh, rapid missiles and things like that. But that's the kill. What a kill it was. And there we have it, a way to make the Guristus Pirates worm an absolutely terrifying frigate to go up against. Like genuinely, this now changes everything in regards to my faction frigate list. It's definitely above the Dromiel, um, simply because the Dromiel is now completely outclassed by the Slasher Interceptor 2. Um, but I think this actually now to me probably comes up into second if not third probably second maybe even first place in that listing i need to kind of consider how this works against something like a, a daredevil i think that this build genuinely can actually deal with a daredevil quite comfortably and um, because the daredevil is going to screen off those drones sure but it's also going to be then taking damage from the missiles the whole way i would probably swap to a uh i'd swap the the, the drone uh, the web of fire sorry for a, uh, a target painter at that point to deal with a daredevil i genuinely reckon this worm could take out a daredevil and certainly the, the the worm can take out ships that a daredevil can only dream of trying to take out i don't think a daredevil would honestly be able to take out the uh, the drake like we've just seen so again some people are going to call me out and say no i'm completely wrong in the in the comment section down below but genuinely I think we've done it. I think we have finally figured out how to make the worm a truly terrifying prospect, both in PvE and in PvP. So humongous well done. Thank you and big shout out there to Frosty Jack for being absolutely incredible and figuring out how to fix the worm. It's been a project of ours for a while. I've been like, oh, I really want the worm to be better. I love this ship. And he's like, yeah, I love it too. It's great fun to fly, even though it's not the best of the faction frigates. Maybe just maybe we could do stuff. What do you think about? He's the guy who's been out testing this one. He's the guy who's been sort of, you know, bouncing the ideas back and forward. He'll say, this is what I'm trying. What do you think? And I'll sort of, we'll have a discussion about it. But let's be fair, Frosty is the genius behind this build. I hereby dub this the Frosty build for the Gurustus Pirates worm. And hopefully some of you folks are tempted to try this out. I look forward to seeing this in space a little bit more. I'm genuinely terrified of seeing this a little bit more because this is one of those I think will honestly quite comfortably deal with most ships that you throw at it like genuinely if you're to throw another frigate at this this can deal with it against uh destroyers as well you've got the damage that you can just rush them down and enough tank to survive it cruisers battle cruisers you've seen that you can outrange and just keep outside of the web of fire and scram range and things like that and just keep from a distance and heck if things go south, at least you're far enough away that you should be outside of scram and uh, warp disruptor range as well so you can just you know disengage and run if you can't kill them so I don't know. I don't know. This has definitely pushed the worm up my rankings. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. I have fallen in love with this ship again. So again, thank you so much to Frosty. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of this one, folks. Happy sailing and see you in New Eden.